I go way back. When Stevie J first came to Bad Boy, after they left Uptown Records and everything like that, and Stevie J and Puff fell out real bad over, you know, uh, it could have been producer credits and the whole nine yards. I don't know what my, whatever someone does in their bedroom, that's what they do. I don't got nothing to do with that. I'm just here to say that I've never seen my man doing anything foul like they talking about. I've never seen it. I've known him for 29 years. And then it's like with guys like, like 50, you know what I'm saying? Like Uncle Tom cast like that. But Stevie J didn't F with him until Love and Hip Hop. When Stevie J went to Love and Hip Hop and he became famous from that, a type of individual that I would have speaking on my behalf. Come on, we know he's a drug abuser. We know that he's been seen putting his hands on women in the wrong way. And I don't know, this, this, that shit is crumbling, man. Man Jean deal came through heavy clowning Stevie J for trying to come at 50 Cent over all that drama with Diddy Jean was straight up saying that if Stevie J actually steps up 50 going to beat him down this whole mess started because 50's been dragging Diddy all over social media for months now. Talking about some wild allegations. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you now you want to put me, I don't know if y'all saw the post where 50 posted about me, of course you guys see Yeah, it. yeah. He's like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, you can't brush under the rug. I, I don't see anybody um, um, reporting about what um, tatted up Holly said about him beating her up and about, you know what I'm saying, his other baby mom said beating her up. I just look at it as, you know, he wants to bring the black community down worse than anyone else. How How is that so? I said what I said on my post and I'm standing on that too. Now, since he didn't accept what my offer to him, and he want to continue to be a comedian, why don't you go make some movies with Michael Blackson and don't talk about me? Hey. If you don't want to fight, if you don't want to donate to charity, donate the bread to charity and fight, don't, don't stop being a girl and talking about dudes. I find it funny that, you know, when they first cru try to crucify somebody, they go through the media first and they're just flooded with lies and propaganda. I'm not concerned about this n Curtis. I mean, this dude Curtis. You know what I'm saying? He's Uncle Tom, and that's just what it is. I'm gonna speak on a thousand percent of what I know to be true about my guy. My spirits are up. He's spending time with his children and his mother. You know what I'm saying? I'm working out. You know, he's, he's doing very well. I've known this guy for 29 years. See, I'm not just a guy off the internet trolling. I'm a first-hand witness. I was, I, was, uh, I was at his crib working in the studio. I was sitting outside the studio door and I heard a big boom. Now, mind you, before we get into this, I've, I'm, I'm not a spring chicken, even though I look fly to you and stuff. But I've witnessed some historical events of, of excessive force, but none like this since um, Saddam Hussein or El Chapo or Pablo Escobar, even. Even Osama bin Laden, I heard a big boom. So I'm thinking like, you know, a lot of people do work on the island all day long, so I'm figuring someone drops the materials. Heard it again. Turn my head, I'm hearing do, 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 do. Armored vehicles, three big armored vehicles come. Dudes jump out, I got 50 dots on my shirt. Screaming, yo, get on the f ground. I'm like, yo, really? I'm the only one here. Took me outside, I asked to speak to the higher ups. I was under arrest. And they said, no, you're being detained. I want to speak to the higher ups. Spoke to the higher ups. Um, I said, am I under arrest? They said, no, you're not. Let me let you go. Boom, let me go check your bags. You don't have any weapons and all. I'm like, I don't have any weapons. One bad. Well, did, did they take electronics? Because they did in Los Angeles. I'm sure they took um, some um, electronics, some of the camera stuff and all that. Probably they didn't want um, him to get a look at what they were doing in his crib, like how they came in with the armored trucks. Of course, they took all that stuff. What did you see when you walked back in? I just don't want to get too much into that. I just know that I walked in and I, I, they messed the man crib up, you know what I'm saying? And um, they did his crib dirty. And, you know, I just ne I haven't seen anything like this in a, in a long time. Can you tell us what um, what his reaction was when you spoke to him the next day? You know, he was just devastated, just just, just um, mainly because he was going out of the country with his daughters for spring break. 
you know, and um, and all, and they had to witness things like that at the airport. Um, I believe that would kind of shift the thinking of any man in general. If, if you're going on vacation with your kids and the feds show up and ruin your trip, and they it's their senior year, you know what I mean? So. I know he was more hurt by that. That weird how he's defending Diddy when he himself got some jaw-dropping scandals. Yeah, we're going to see, man. We're going to see what they got. But speaking of the raid, right, did you see that viral video of Diddy he was seen in Miami with Stevie J after the raid? You seen that video? Yeah, I seen it. I seen it. What you think about that? Well, I go way back when Stevie J first came to Bad Boy after they left Uptown Records and everything like that. And Stevie J and Puff fell out real bad over, you know, uh, it could have been producer credits and the whole nine yards, but Stevie J didn't F with him until Love and Hip Hop. When Stevie J went to Love and Hip Hop and he became famous from that, Puff called him over there and they had a meeting and I guess they rekindled their friendship because I used to bodyguard Stevie J and, you know, uh, go to different clubs. So, you know, I got pictures and everything. Stevie J didn't, uh, he didn't mess with Puff, you know, until after that love and hip hop thing went down, you know. So now they back cool. What got me about the stuff like that, that them being back cool, that Stevie J went on TMZ and was speaking up on behalf of them. Now, if anybody I want speaking up behalf of me, or I had anybody speaking up on, on my behalf, it wouldn't be Stevie J. You understand? I don't think that uh, an individual of his caliber is capable or can be trusted in a way that I would like for him based on his actions on television and who he is as a person, what he has been shown as a individual is a type of individual that I would have speaking on my behalf. Come on, we know he's a drug abuser. We know that he's been seen putting his hands on women in the wrong way. It, I don't know. This, this, that shit is crumbling, man. You know what I'm saying? But you, you, you know, you can always say this, man. And, and, and the infamous words of one of the world's greatest comedians, Richard Pry, cocaine is a hell of a drug. Why you say that? Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Cause, La Rob said that they be doing the liquid cocaine. In the, in the bottles, in the Ciroc bottles. We know Stevie J been in countless rehabs back and forth. We know we've heard of Puff being in rehabs, secretly going to rehabs too. So my man, when you get on those type of psychotropical, uh, I think it's psychotropical drugs, man, and you start believing your own bullshit. And them two individuals together, man, man. You know, you know they gotta be crazy. Something gotta be wrong with when, when he sit up there and he said that he wanna challenge 50. He and, and, and I don't know much about that clout shit. Him challenging 50 to a fight, and we seen how 50 sit. We seen how Stevie J fight on love and hip hop and all that other bullshit. Him Scrappy, him, uh, this other cat. My man, there's no way. There's no way. He 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 don't want it with 50, bro. That, that's, if that ain't cocaine, the Pope ain't Catholic. So you feel like 50 Cent would give Stevie J that work? It wouldn't even be a job. 50 Cent would whoop 50 Cent will whoop niggas like Stevie J on the way to a real fight. You seen 50 fight before? I ain't never seen 50 fight. I seen some tapes of him get down, 
on that end, but I never seen him fight in person. But I know the demeanor of a man. I was with 50 Cent on a couple of occasions, and one occasion, it was just me and 50, and about probably six other dudes that didn't want to get out the car because he was ready to get down. And you could see it in him. You could see he got it in him like that. I'm looking at him. I wrote this shit about, about this shit in my book. 50 ain't back, he don't back down, bro. And you could see when when you know a dude is about it, about it, and got it in him, you could see it in his eye. You could see it in the way he, he, he carry himself. You see how he threw his own man in the bushes, Tony Ayo. They got takes on 50 getting down boxing. I've seen, I've seen takes on him. You know what I'm saying? I've never seen him in person, you know, as far as fighting. I've been with him in person, but he got it in him, bro. But yeah, yeah, they caught me by surprise because I always knew that Stevie J, he did production for Bad Boy, but I never knew him and D was that close until, you know, as of late, you know, since the raid, so. Yo, they was close. They, yo, bro, Stevie, Stevie J and Puff was like pots and pans back in the day. I don't know what happened between them, but something happened on the producing credit side that Stevie J stopped effing with him. And you know, Stevie wasn't dealing with him at all. He was just doing more stuff for, uh, for Jodeci than he was bad boy. Stevie J didn't take kindly to 50's post and even threw out a challenge saying he wants to fight 50 in a televised match. He was heated talking about how he's going to shoot the Fade with 50, but as usual, 50 didn't back down. He just laughed it off and kept trolling. He even posted a funny video of Stevie J fighting on love and hip hop, making it clear that Stevie J didn't deny those wild allegations 50 made. What do you think about the news breaking that um, 50 Cent has sold his documentary series, um, uh, Surviving Diddy, to Netflix? I mean, I hope I never have to go to war with 50 Cent. <laughs> that dude is a troll. That dude is the, he's the best. He, boy, he, he, he's the art of war. He know how to, he know how to go at, go at it. But the way I understand it is he uh, sold the rights, right, to Next Flag. He had a bidding war and he sold the rights to all the different streaming companies that wanted to do it. It's gonna be interesting to see what he gets. Uh, he might, can only do, what, reenactments from, from the lawsuit? He can't get Cassie to talk about it. Trust me, <clears throat> Cassie can't talk about this publicly. They might can get law enforcement might can get her, get it, you know, get her to talk on a jury stand or witness stand, grand jury or something like that. But just to go and do interviews, she can't do it. She probably can't even mention the name Sean Combs or, or, or any of his family members talk about anything. So, is it going to be Misa? I doubt it. It's hard for females that have kids by men to do these, uh, to, to talk bad about their, 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 you know, their father, no matter how much of a douchebag he is. And so, Who's, who's going to be the, the survivors? Is it going to be Little Rod? I, you know, he's going to get his bag eventually, trust me. And he's and he going to have to sign, you know, an agreement not to talk about it publicly. So I think it's just 50 uh, jumping the gun, wanting to be a hell of a troll, and, and him being like me, very, very vindictive. I wonder if 50 or Leo like me. <laughs> I, Gotta find out his sign because I swear me and him have the same traits. But uh, I don't know who would be the victims. We know a young Miami, she finally done broke away. Saw that she unfollowed him recently. Uh, Misa, we know Kim Porter and her book. If you can get a hold of that. I just think a lot of it's going to have to be reenactment. Or maybe our boy 
because I know he likes Gene Deal and Gene Deal like him a lot. Maybe my boy Arthur Dialogue about to get rich and he likes a lot of his footage uh, from Art's channel. Uh, or Mark Curry, whatever, you know, he said. I'm just wondering where they're going to get the footage from. Who are they going to get to speak on that? Did 50 find the male escorts? Or is it, it got to be just reenactments from from the different lawsuits. Um, and there's a new young lady that came out and filed a new lawsuit recently. Uh, maybe it would be worth her while just to tell her story and not... Uh, you know, go through with, with the lawsuit or at least sign an agreement and just demand. I can't sign an agreement saying I'm not going to talk about it. The issue is we want to see the people like we did on the Surviving R. Kelly. Y'all saw parents. Y'all saw, y'all got R to talk a little bit. Y'all got, uh, I'm sorry, R, R. Kelly to talk a little bit. Y'all, y'all got footage of things that had happened. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what 50 can pull out to really make a uh, a good showing. Because that shit that we saw on Tubi, a lot of people saw it, thought it was good. Uh, but I I didn't. I didn't personally care for it. But um, even though fucking uh, TMZ... Yeah, you know, we'll be getting contact real soon because we just noticed, John and I just discovered that y'all did use some of our footage with WAC 100 on uh, on that show. And y'all ain't contact us. Y'all know y'all can't be licensing stuff without, or putting stuff in uh, y'all TV shows without it getting licensed. So that's where I think 50 gonna Go, he's going to go the reenactment things from reading things. And are y'all going to be happy with that? Are y'all going to want to see reenactments or are you going to really want to see live footage, live interviews? Um, that's going to be a challenge. But 50 got the resource, he has the, uh, uh, the writers that can put it together. And, um, I'm sure he's going to make it good. If it's anything that he has done, if it's like anything that he has done, because I remember when I was away for a little, little while, it was a show on ABC uh, with that dude that got sentenced with life. And we used to sit around the table watching that, waiting for that to come on every night, every or Monday night or Tuesday night, whenever it came on. And so everything, it didn't come on or get a second season, but... Uh, Everything he has touched, I I have like, I love the power, I love the Canaan, I love BML. It's not too much that he hasn't done uh, as far as TV series uh, that I haven't enjoyed. And so he would be the perfect person for it. It would just be interesting to see if he'll be able to uh, or how he's planned to. Gene Deal Diddy's former bodyguard had no problem adding fuel to the fire saying Stevie J doesn't stand a chance against 50. It's just another layer of drama in this ongoing saga between these hip hop heavyweights 50 stays unfazed keeping the heat on. Everyone tied to Diddy and Stevie J is out here trying to defend his man's honor. Whoever he think gonna get him free if he had, and whoever they want. You gotta realize the feds is not gonna touch those people if he had anything to do with any high profile uh, people like Clyde Davis, uh, uh, what's that, Jimmy over at Interscope? What's his name, Jimmy Iveen? Any high profile people the feds is not gonna touch. You understand? They are gonna go for the people who are not his really handlers unless they really want them or somebody want them. So, uh, it's hard to really say, but if they want to make examples out of certain people, you understand, they're going to go for those people. I, I can't really give you a number. I can't really tell you who's the people because I don't know who on their list. 
But if they want to make an example out of somebody, anybody that's been to those Diddy like Epstein parties and stuff like that, they gonna go, they gonna go after them. What you think about Stevie J? And I know you and him, y'all was going back and forth, but how you feel about him defending Diddy? He don't have nothing else to do, man. What what what, make, what makes me mad at Stevie them is is that, you know, they don't realize the guys who used to take care of them, the guys that make sure they got in the club, the guys who make they sure they got in the studio, the guys that make sure they got home at night. And then they get on this thing and because they become more known to the public and everything on Love and Hip Hop and all these other different programs, they want to talk shit. But Stevie J, no, I'm the type of dude, he talk about I got bad knees, I kick him so far up in his ass, he touch shoe polish, he taste shoe polish, bro. I do not play with that. I'm the one that used to make sure that you was all right. You understand? And I got pictures when I used to bodyguard you, bro. And you know I never played those games. So because you get mad, because I say something about, you know what I know fit, I know, I know fit. And I know you. You understand? If I gotta put my house up, if I gotta put my car, my jewelry, I'm putting my shit up on 50. I'm not gonna put it on you. I'm just telling you what I know. 50 hit that nigga so hard, man. <laughs> he won't wake up to the middle of next week. He gets on here and he wanna defend, did he defend him? You might be on some of them tapes. Nine times out of 10, you, you good at making tapes. You know the tapes that you made before in the past that made the internet. I'm not gonna speak on that, Mighty, not at all. You understand? Cause it's got a young lady that's doing her thing in it and she don't need to be spoken on. But you know, everybody who knows what I'm talking about, they know the tapes that made the internet with Stevie J before. You know what I mean? So for him to come to Puff Defense, you don't have nothing. He gotta come to his defense. Heard he lost his house, heard he lost this, that, and the third, the whole nine yard. He's staying with a grown man at another man's house. So what else are you gonna do? Puff said, y'all come to my defense? He's the only one came to his defense. In the tape that she was referring to, and you don't have to go into detail about it, I think most people would know what she was talking about, but she was referring to the sex tape between Stevie J and Eve, right? And I don't know if this is true, you could tell me, but I heard that he leaked it, right? Allegedly, yeah, he's the one who leaked it. Wanna be in the sun, you know what I'm saying? That's how those cats do, bro. They, they, they wanna be, they sit back, and because this is the new form of entertainment, and regular dudes, or getting more views than they are, they get mad and they get upset. You understand what I'm saying? They get mad and they get upset because this is the new form of entertainment and a lot of people are blowing them out the water now. And they wanna say crazy stuff when in fact, they wouldn't breathe hard if you was in the room with them. Yeah, that's real talk. And I was checking out one of your lives and you made a comment saying that, you know, Diddy, his ship is sinking fast because the only person that's coming out to defend him is Stevie J. Well, Diddy did a post and he said, speak now or forever hold your peace. And he sent the message to everybody that he did business with or everybody that was around him. Y'all talk, y'all speak on me. Y'all let everybody know what y'all know about me or whatever, this, that, and the third. And if they talking negative, straighten them out based on our relationship. So he put that message out there. So now people are saying, nah, bro, like Ray J. Ray J say, yo, people wanna know what it is. Because if the federal government is asking questions about you having some pedophilia or having sex with little boys under age, why would I want to be connected to that? Why are they even asking that type of question about you? 
So now he's telling people, yo, speak on me, speak on me. Now people are like, no, we don't even know what the charge is. We don't know what they got on you. So the safe thing for me to do is to stay away from you until we know. I'm not gonna mess, they saying I'm not gonna mess up my brand. I'm not gonna mess up me getting money because what the, what the internet is gonna do is that anybody that speaks up for them, they're gonna automatically think they had something to do with it. Diddy, also known as Sean Combs, has found himself embroiled in a series of controversies that are rocking the hip hop world recently. His legal troubles have intensified with Homeland Security reportedly raiding his properties as part of an ongoing investigation into various allegations. These raids are a significant blow to Diddy's reputation, casting a shadow over his legacy in the music industry. Girls, I wanna go back to this interview that he did with Rolling Stone. He said that Diddy, he was jealous of the relationship between Tupac and Big. And he also went on to say that Diddy, he wanted to be friends with Tupac, but Tupac wasn't interested. Diddy and Tupac was friends at first, bro. I remember the time me and uh, Diddy rolled up to Pac in, uh, I think it's the, what's the name of that club? The Roxy. It was some kind of concert going on and they was talking and everything. They had a friendship. I don't know why their friendship fell out. Their friendship was before Diddy, I mean, before Biggie and Pop. So I don't know why they fell out. I know every girl that Tupac had, Puff wanted and got. So did he have uh, jealousy? Yeah, he had a jealousy of Pac. But I think that it was more so that he knew Big was the meal ticket. And that Pac wanted Big to be with him with Thug Life, but he didn't have the money at the time. And when Big gave him, got the money from Puff, Pac gave him the blessings to go with him, but he also told Big that he had to watch Puff because Puff was going to rob him blind. So you believe Kirk Burroughs when he say that, you know, Diddy, he was jealous of the relationship between Tupac and Big? I don't know if I could say he was jealous with his relationship with Big. I just, he didn't like Pac. It's something that happened between Pac and him that he didn't like it. So if my man or somebody that I'm working with is dealing with somebody I don't like, I'm gonna have a dislike for that relationship they have. I don't just think it's jealousy. I think it more was just a dick's like and a hatred that somebody I'm working with is working with somebody that I don't like anymore or I got a problem with. So you feel like it was intentional when Diddy was getting with, you know, the same woman that Tupac already had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's. I think it was. I think that he purposely went after the girls that dealt with Pop. Why you think he did that on purpose? Because when you have an envy of someone, remember Puff tried to get that Juice movie and Juice, but they gave it to Pop. So when you have an envy of somebody, if you can't beat them, the closest thing you could do is have what they got. Have what, have what they had or try to get what they got. Yeah, that makes sense. And Kirk Burroughs, he also said in this interview that Diddy, he would encourage Biggie to make songs that was beefy. I don't think Kirk Burroughs was correct on that because Biggie didn't write around Puff. Big always wrote wherever he wrote at and then went to record. If he wrote anything, or came up with some kind of concept of something. You're not gonna find too many times Big and Puff was in the studio together where Big was recording. Puff may come in after the work is done and then add his little, take that, take that. Bad boy, bad boy. But Big always record, cause like when we were doing the, uh, uh, the music to uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony. 
Big said, I ain't writing shit. He sat there and smoked up all their weed. And he waited till he got to New York and then came back with the song. Flipped their whole style. Big didn't ever write around nobody. Like, Puff had no... Puff never, you know, told Big what to write and what not to write. Not in my eyes. I didn't see that. Tree Diddy's infamous parties have also come under fire with accusations that they were more than just social gatherings. Cat Williams and others have suggested that these events were fronts for more sinister activities, including manipulation and coercion. These claims have intensified the controversy surrounding Diddy, adding to the growing list of accusations against him. Man, I appreciate y'all bringing me to y'all beautiful city. Man, you looking real, that couch look real small on you, brother. I'm like, <laughs> 600, six, 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 seven, 327 pounds. Massive. Yeah. Man, you know, you have a legendary story, man. You've been through a lot. Uh, you've seen a lot. And yes, we want to get all the way into it, man. Uh, first off, though, you from that STL. St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised. Man, uh, depending on what part are you talking about, <laughs> you in the trenches. Uh, North side, North okay. St. Louis, and then I moved to a subdivision called Wellston. That's the place Nelly said, when he got a problem, he go get his Wellston niggas. That's where I'm from, Wellston. So, give us a little childhood memory about growing up in Wellston, you know, for anybody who ain't never been to that side. Well, you know, I got two books out, bro. One book is called Gene Deal, My World of Bodyguard and a Hip Hop Star. And the second one is Gene Deal, Life After Death, When Bodyguard and a Hip Hop Star. The first book tells about my childhood Growing up in Wellston, I met my mother at the age of 12 years old, where I moved out from St. Louis, from the north side, to the Wellston, Missouri, where my mother was at. Uh, Wellston is a, uh, it's the ghetto among ghettos. There's only 6,000 people. People ain't stop at the stop sign when you went to Wellston. So if you know what they're talking about, when if you came out of Wellston, you had to educate yourself because the school district, if you came out of high school, you probably had a sixth or seventh grade education. So let me ask you, for those that, you know, they, some people know your story and uh, they see you on this couch, so they know what we're about to get into. Um, as a curiosity, uh, you, for those who don't know, your profession was a bodyguard. Not at all. Okay, go ahead, please. Don't My professional was, in, I was professional in a New York State parole officer, oh. where I worked for 27 years. You understand? My second profession was an investigator for elite investigation, where I ran the investigations of housing projects in the city, Lambert Houses, Taino Towers, East Chester Manor, some of the roughest housing projects in the city in the Bronx. My third profession, which wasn't like what you might say a bodyguard, I started what you call with some other guys, ASAP Ferg father, Mike Cox, Myself, we started what we called the same gang. The same gang was a group of guys who, at the time, Harlem was coming up. Instead of them having cliques and they they called cliques and crews. Instead of them having gangs and stuff like that, we were people that partied together. You know what I'm saying? Had a lot of fun, gave picnics, and that's where you got the guy Sean Combs came in when we brought him into the same gang. So. Uh, I be I was like what you y'all call now a OG because I started it. You understand? So then Puff had some problems at the place called the building and the red zone. Red zone and the building was parties that he was doing. The building was the unsigned hype. If you ever seen Juice and the guy was doing the um the turntables and stuff yeah. like that, I think it was Omar Epps or something like that. Yeah, I think it was Omar. Right, that, that was the building. That's where they was giving the party there where you had leaders of the new school, Queen Latifah, uh, different groups come there showing their talent, Naughty by Nature's and all like that. They would show their talent there. So Puff was having problems there and D. Ferg, one of the leaders of the same gang, which is ASAP Ferg father, said, yo, Gene. He ongoing feud with 50 Cent has only exacerbated Diddy's problems. 50 Cent has been relentless in his social media attacks, bringing up various allegations and keeping the spotlight firmly on Diddy this feud has. Drawn significant public attention with 50 Cent digging up and amplifying every piece of dirt he can find on Diddy. Puff need 
you know, some help, man. You know, he need to get that money home at night and everything like that, you know, to Kirk Burroughs and stuff like that. So why don't you go help him out? I said, I don't got no problem with that. So I put him up under my wing, so I started helping him out, you know, by, you know, making sure when the end of the party and stuff like that, get in the car, bring him uptown. So to answer your question, I'm sorry about that. My profession first was, uh, like I said, a parole officer, then an investigator, you know, which it was with the housing projects and stuff like that. Then that bodyguard thing was just me looking after, you know, people that was in our crew and click. So is it safe to say that you were familiar with like the music industry of some sorts before uh, Puff came to the Well, I think that I got involved with the music industry because a guy named Tim Dog. If you know Tim Dog is not the one who had the um, that F Compton thing. Tim Dog was one of the A and R's for uh, Uptown Records. He went on to be a president of Island Records. The president, uh, I think, he was the president of A and R over Arista Records. They was having problems at parties, you know, because dudes in New York didn't think they could wait online. So. I became that dude that got a click together, got a crew together, and we started doing security at the front doors at all the Uptown Record parties, all the parties that Tim Dog, Butt Naked, and different people was given. You understand? And got, whereas that people didn't try to bum rush the door no more. People didn't try to, you know, run up in the parties and, you understand? So I came famous with that. You more like a problem solver or a problem deflector, I guess. Yeah problems come to the door. Well, it, it wasn't just me, it was my team. The whole team is... The team was like, I, I, I hired four officers and I hired, hired about eight dudes that was from the streets, you understand? And one one cop and had dogs. When you're putting together a team, what are you looking for inside of a man to like know if he's built for this? Well, if you hang with us, you built for it, point blank. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't look for guys outside our crew. So when you were uh, at these parties and you know, making sure things were going certain situations, were there any younger cats that we might recognize today that would ever try to like act like they were better than or try to force their way or push their way past y'all? That came in the later days, man. You know, that's what, that's, that came when dudes would have like 20 or 30 guys with them because they were scared. You understand? But you got to realize when you had certain people that was out there with me, you had Slick, Tima, these guys are known in the street. You know, they the, they the godfather of some of the biggest gangsters that you heard of, Alpo, Lou Sims. You understand? They respected them. So now when I got them working and we they part of the team and they run into security like that, Ain't nobody gonna try nothing, bro. So, man, let's let's get right to it then. Um, to be what you were doing in your team, y'all had to have seen some evil shit, like some pretty fucked up shit coming from niggas with money. So. Well, you you see that from niggas who don't have money, right. also. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, you see a lot of shit. It is what it is. So, you know, I have to ask you that because sometimes when you see like, uh, let's say, a, a puff. You might have a manager who might be an enabler, like to help them get to it, like R. Kelly, whoever. And you have their bodyguards or security unit who might allow some things to take place. Might see it and just, hey, we're gonna just allow because, you know, hey, it's the essence. What was your mentality when it comes to the enablers or the people that allow or just what, you know, how did you approach the situation that you're like, I don't know about that? I don't know what you mean by that question. <laughs> That was such a broad yeah, and yeah. asinine ass question <laughs> that uh, let me it's be, hard to answer something like let that. Let me be more direct. Let me yeah, be, more be direct. direct, bro. Let me be more direct. Yeah. Were you... Further complicating matters, Foxy Brown recently made explosive claims about Jay-Z indirectly dragging Diddy into the controversy these allegations have sparked a new wave of gossip and speculation further damaging Diddy's public image. The association with these claims has only added to the scrutiny Diddy is facing... An enabler 
or did you allow or see stuff that you're like, man, I ain't gonna jump in that? Bruh, that go ahead. Criminals do crimes with criminals. I've never been a criminal. You understand what I'm saying? Gotcha. So now, uh, if you're looking to answer something about Puff, Puff ain't the Puff. Puff had different phases of his life that y'all don't understand. And let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. You understand? First you got Puff Daddy, who had Daddy's house and the parties and things like that. Then you had Puff, you understand? Then you had Diddy, then you had Brother Love, and then Love. I had Puff around the stage when he was Puff Daddy and Puff and some of Diddy. Not the new Diddy that they gave the Diddler and everything like that. So he ain't the guy, he wasn't the guy that y'all see now back then when he was in Harlem. You understand? He was the guy that our crew chased down the street because he was trying to be a part of it and he ran. You understand? We brought him back, beat the shit out of him, hit him in the head with cake spoon with champagne and all the other shit like that. He was wanted to be a part of us. He was the one used to beg, don't go to the party, please, please, I'm on my way. I'm on my way so he could walk in the club with us. You understand? So to answer that question, bro, you're not doing nothing that's gonna cost my livelihood. You understand? You're not gonna do anything in front of me to cost my livelihood. You understand? Now, have I seen some shit? I seen a dude come up in the club and blow somebody head off. I see the smoke running through the crowd trying to get to the lights. You understand? At a New Year's Eve party. So now I see this guy laying on his on the ground with his head tore down to the white meat. Did I know who did it? No. Did somebody tell me it's about to happen? Yes, they did. Yo, Gene, somebody got some a gun in here. No, they didn't. We searched everybody. He came through the back door of the kitchen. You understand? Yeah. Because it was a it was a restaurant that was giving a party. The guy came through the back. I run and turn off the light. And as soon as I hit the light switch, you see pow, and the gun smoke do ran. That's the kind of crazy shit we see. You see girls having sex in the bathroom. That's crazy shit. You grab them with the guys and you throw them out the club. You understand? Yeah. So yeah, it gets like that. Right. I have to ask real quick. Um, Diddy's pops. I, I saw you. you there was a, uh, you had mentioned that as far as Diddy Pops, his dad was murdered? Yes, sir. Yeah, that I didn't know. Um, Did you did you know of his Pops? I didn't know of his Pop. I didn't know sh jack shit about his Pops. I learned from his Pop of one of the biggest gangsters in Harlem, New York Freddy, right? The police said they went to New York Freddy house in Mount Vernon and he had stacks of $100 bills six feet high in the whole basement. That's how much money he had. He was the one who started Russell Simmons. They won't tell y'all this story. He was the one who started Russell Simmons and them into the music business because he had a record label first that Russell Simmons used to work for. So now, New York Freddy want to talk to Big Gene. One of his lieutenants back in the day, if you can see his story, his name was Omar. Omar was our OG from 112th Street, 114th Street. They used to come around with us. They used to love the food I used to cook because I'm a hell of a cook. You know what I'm saying? So now, Omar said, yo, New York Freddy want to talk to you, Gene. I told him he used to bodyguard Puff because he want to talk to Puff and tell Puff the real story about his father. So I said, yeah, all right. So I'm like, New York Freddy. I knew my history. I knew what New York Freddy was about. So I went and took a meeting with New York Freddy. He said, New York Freddy said to me, he said, yo, man, I've been trying to get in touch with Puff. Russell Simmons, none of them would take my calls. It's all good. He said, I want to tell Puff the true story about his father. And I said, you're all right, okay, you know, what's up? You're gonna listen to those guys, you understand? So New York Freddy said, uh, Puff father sold some drugs to one of the undercover guys. You understand? They arrested him, because they had cops on the payroll to you know, see what you about. About with all these factors combined, Diddy's situation looks increasingly dire. The entertainment world is closely watching as more details emerge, and it's clear that these controversies will continue to unfold, further impacting Diddy's legacy and standing in the industry. 
He said they bought, brought him the tape and the written confection that Puff Father signed. So I was like, yo. He said, he said we gave him $10,000. It was a New York City cop that he worked for them. He said, we gave him $10,000. Puff Father said that he only told because he had a wedding to go to, which I thought was hilarious. You understand? This is coming from New York Freddie. So he said that I wanted to talk to Puff, but he wouldn't take my calls, he wouldn't see me. He said, I wanted to let him know that I told the guy, y'all gotta get rid of him. Y'all brought him in, y'all gotta get rid of him. So all these people talking about he worked for Frank Lucas, he worked for that part like that. He may have gotten some things from them or whatever, did some work. Nah, he worked with New York Freddy team. And New York Freddy told the dude to get rid of him. Now, if Puff Father was all that big of a gangster and he was all that and everything like that, why is he driving a cab? None of the gangsters in Harlem drove cabs. They drove Cadillacs, Rolls Royce, Mercedes, etc. You understand what I'm saying? So now, Puff Father get murked by the dude that brought him in. And New York Freddy said to me, he said, I want to let him know the dude that was crying at the hardest at the funeral, carrying the casket, was the one who killed him. Yeah. So now, this is crazy to me, right? About a month ago, I told that story, right? A young lady, a woman, who was dating Puff father, hit me on, what y'all, DM me on the- Yeah, the DM. Yeah, yeah, the Instagram. She said, uh, Big Gene, she said, thank you for telling my story, that story. He said, I was dating for Puff father. And I went up to Flash Inn. It was a it was a thing on 155th and McCombs Avenue in Harlem. I was waiting for him the next day. Cause he had told me the day before he was killed that to meet him up there. He said, New York Freddy and all they crew was up there laughing and joking. And they knew about Puff Father that got killed. So now I knew why they was doing that. Yes, sir. Real nice shoes. Um, what made you leave uh, Diddy's side? Who said I left his side? You said what made him, you said what made me leave his side? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the whole well, work well, for Puff, Puff, um, ASAP Ferg father mm -hmm. went to Puff, and there's two reasons. He asked Puff to do a favor for him. He was in a certain situation. And I took him up there. I had $10,000 of Puff money in my pocket because we had left North Carolina. He was going somewhere and he didn't want to take the money with him. And this was about two weeks later. It was a week before my birthday, like four or five days before my birthday. D said, yo, I want to go up to the office and talk to Puff. I said, all right, come on, I'll take you up there. So then he went and talked to Puff. He had some design. He was one of the best designers in Harlem. He had a street, he had a clothing company on 145th Street. And, huh? Yeah, that's ASAP Ferg father. Yeah, so now, now they were really heavy into the clothing. Yeah, he, you know, he the one designed the uh, Bad Boy logo. Yeah, and he designed the old Uptown Record logo too. You know what I'm saying? So this guy was incredible. The people used to come and steal his, his designs and mass produce it. He was the one who put all the things. Remember? remember the situation with Foxy Brown is way muddy than you expected to be. I feel you, but Foxy Brown, how you feel about the news that broke that, you know, she might testify against Keefe D? Well, I knew Foxy was out there with Zipna. And the story that I heard was, is that when Keefe D and them saw Tupac them. They told Zip them they was gonna go holler 
at those dudes. Zip them in one way and Keefy D them with the other way. The other way was to where Pacman was at. I heard that that night. I heard the full story when an individual who was out there with them came back to the block and told us. Now, Foxy has been through a lot of shit in this industry. A lot of things, brother. And if people think that Jag War Wright has been damaged in this industry, Foxy is a whole nother problem for them. It's going to be really interesting if she gets on a jury stand and remembers or either articulate anything that happened that night. And that's what I'm going to say about that. So for the people that don't know, right, what was Foxy Brown's connection to Keefe D and Zoo in that whole situation? Foxy Brown is maybe number one or number two the hottest female rapper at that time bar you know Lil Kim Foxy Brown Foxy got one of the hottest songs with Jay-Z Foxy own album did numbers Foxy is Brooklyn she's hanging with Zip Zip is Mike Tyson right hand man they like family you understand what I'm saying so she's out there partying with them she's hot She's fine, young girl in that whole nine yards. She's having fun with them. You know what I'm saying? You got Foxy Brown in your crew. You got other ladies and other people coming because they know she's a celebrity at this time. So she's hanging with them. She got passes to go, what, to the party? She got passes to go to the fight because she's with Zip them. You understand what I'm saying? So now, she's in the car with them so happy when they on their way to 626. That's when Keefe D them is in the other car. So Foxy car in the car was zipping them. She could testify that Keefe D was there. He went one way and we went the other way. Did he go see Park them? She can't testify to them because they wasn't there when it went down. You understand what I'm saying? So that's what they probably wanted to do. Zip ain't here. He probably wouldn't have testified in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? He wouldn't have testified in the first place, but Foxy is here and she was at the scene. Can she place Keefe D in the vicinity? She probably could. But my thing is this, right? If she was out there with Zip, I always heard that she was dating, you know, corrupt at that time. So I'm a little confused. Like, how did that work? Bro, that don't mean she, uh, that don't mean she's sex and Zip and them. She out there, they, they homeboys. Zip from New York, she from New York. That's their protection. Zip got bodyguards and people with him. So that's because she's with corrupt. That don't make she's out there doing nothing with them. She's a young lady, she's out there. She needs to feel safe, she needs to feel protected. And she's a superstar. She's a star. Foxy was still a star then, bro. In 96, Foxy was a star still. You think she gonna testify? She has to. If they subpoena her to testify, she either has to use her Fifth Amendment right. If anyone got them receipts on everyone, including Diddy, it's Foxy. She allegedly dated Jay Z when she was 15. That's interview, man. Um, you know, you made a comment and you said that um, Foxy Brown was one of the females you was talking to back then. If you don't mind, man, um, take me through that. Um, how did that come about? How did you and uh, Foxy Brown meet? How did you knock Foxy Brown? Kind of funny though, cause we we talking about 30 years now. If not 25, you know, I'm talking about. 
Foxy just fucked with my boy. Uh, correct. Shit was over. You know what I'm talking about? You know, uh, and then we had the Doggy Angels. Which was the homegirls. We used to be in Beverly Hills. I forgot this club, but I'm sure everybody else would know. But we used to be in that motherfucker thick. You feel me? And, uh, you know, Fox used to be around, you know, at the same time. I just, you know, corrupt. That was his bitch, whatever. But at the time that this whole situation happened, they wasn't even fucking with her. So, like I said, the van got broke down in, in Beverly Hills where he pulled up. No, they pulled up. My pulled up in the bins at the key club after Mike Epps did a little, you know, little stand up and did what he did because we wasn't selling drinks at the time. We were just selling bottles. You feel me? And at this time, it was on the track. It had hella holes. You feel me? It was, it was like a thousand holes on Sunset Boulevard. You know what I'm talking about? So it was a good look. At this time, uh, niggas come pick me up. We jump in the car. Bam, bam. Some motherfuckers pull up on the slide up it. And a white Benz. A little Benz. Like, we in a 500, so they in a 400. Some some little, but they had the they had the same rim. Her looked at C and said, "Come out your rims." <laughs> we like sixty in the car. We stacked bitches got their legs over. We stacked, and I'm like, "It's late, right?" We got security in the car too, and we're like, "I'm gonna jump." C jumped out the car, drove off. He ran to the trunk to get the thing thing, right? All right, let's go, fuck. So, well, had the same, had the same, had the motherfucking same, uh, uh. Had the same shit, right? They ain't them dropping me off. Now, to think about it right now today, I don't even know how I got her number. You feel me? I don't even remember how I got her number. But I know where it was at. We was right across the street from uh, House of Blues. What's the name of that spot? I don't know one of my, you know? Right across. From House of Blood. Huh? On Sunset. Then the hotel. Well, check this out. Hey, Some reason I'm on the phone. She's like, yeah, I need it. Won't, won't, won't. And I'm, I'm going there. I get there. Won't, won't, won't. I jump out the car. I'm walking through the hotel. I'm walking through the hotel. I'm walking through the hotel. When I push through the hotel, I'm driving down. I don't even think about shit. I just look to the left. When they drive down, I just see a car just block them off. That's the same car. They're like, come out your rims. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this is the same, right? So I'm back up. I'll do a little, you know, bicycle. I see everybody cars just go blah blah blah. Everybody fighting. Boom boom bam bam boom boom boom. I come down. Boom 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 boom. I'm shot. Boom boom boom. Motherfuckers running. Everybody running. Boom boom boom. It's one I can't never forget. In LA. We'd love to hear what y'all think about this. 